But if I had a, a, an actor and I put on a lab coat and, and I throw him in a medical office and start sending him patients, and you know he pretends to be a doctor and listens to them and puts a stethoscope on their on their on their chest, and by the end of the visit, the only thing he does is put people on the elimination diet. Judging by the results, he would be he or she would be one of the best doctors in the neighborhood. Hey everybody, Dr. Josh Axe here along with Dr. Alejandro Younger, and I'm a huge fan of his. I've been reading his books for years, his book Clean, Clean Gut, another big favorite of mine, and he's been the physician for a lot of well-known people, including Gwyneth, Gwyneth Paltrow. In fact, before we got started here, him and I were just talking about his work with Goop, uh, which I'm a big fan of, and uh, and just talking about uh, Gwyneth and some others here as well. And um, by training, Dr. Alejandro is a, a cardiologist, but really has do, really dives deep into gut health, uh, the immune system, and really just how to heal the body naturally. In fact, he also has learned a lot of his um, expertise in India and the practice of Eastern medicine, and he is a uh, a medical doctor who is also trained in, at New York University. And so anyways, he's someone I've really respected over the years and a lot of his teachings. And uh, uh, Dr. Alejandro, just really excited to have you on today. I'm excited too. All right. Well, let's talk about, we're going to talk about just clean in general. And also we're going to talk about gut health. I'm really excited to get your advice on leaky gut syndrome and also just taking care of conditions from that more Ayurvedic, Chinese medicine, more Eastern perspective. So let, let's dive in and, and, uh, and start with this question though. How did you go from being more medically trained, but a lot of what you practice today is more Eastern or what some people consider integrative or natural medicine. That was, I was born and raised in Uruguay. And in Uruguay, you know, 50 years ago when I was born, um, things were very simple and there were no supermarkets and there were no, basically no processed foods. Um, my dad and I would go to the farmer's market around the corner and we would know the farmers and, 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 and he would, teach me how to choose the fruits and the vegetables. So life was really simple and, and, and more as it was for hundreds of years. Then I moved to New York after medical school and life was completely different. And there was no time for, for preparing food. So I would go to the supermarkets and I was fascinated. I was like, uh, I felt like an Aboriginal in the in, 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 in a different planet, I, I would look at the boxes and the colors and the, and, and, and the smells and, and, and the fact that you could get a box and put it in a microwave and have a meal that kind of looked like what it took my mom a whole day to prepare and you just had it in two minutes. So I was fascinated with all of this. And, and you know, in medical school at that time, we just learned about food in terms of what was a carbohydrate, what was a, a fat, and what, and, and what was a protein, and that was it. So I had no concept of what was healthy foods and, and, and what that could do to a patient or to a person, right? And, and, and so living this crazy, busy life in New York, having no time to prepare foods, eating from the cafeteria and from vending machines, I became really sick. So at one point, I was so sick, I, 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 I got really overweight, I couldn't function. And I, I decided to take a day off from work and go see three of the top specialists in New York. Because, you know, when you're a resident, you kind of make relationships with people and you get appointments with doctors that otherwise it's difficult to. So I saw an allergist, a gastroenterologist, and a psychiatrist for the three things that were the, the that bothered me the most so so i ended up that day with three diagnoses and seven prescription medications i was diagnosed with severe allergies severe depression and irritable bowel syndrome and when i got home and i looked at these prescriptions i had this double aha moment one of them was i don't want to take this a, a panoplopia of, of a um, pills in order to function and the other thing was this is exactly what I'm doing to my patients too mm. so I became profoundly disappointed and and and, uh, and and disillusioned with the whole thing and and I decided to take another route so I used to go to Barnes and Nobles and pick up books and try to learn and and um, 
you know, and t reading references from this and that, I ended up finding about meditation and I decided to start looking for a meditation teacher, found one. And to make a long story short, I ended up in India in a monastery. And, and the, the, my excuse there was to go and offer my services as a doctor so that I could learn to meditate and, and, uh, and calm my mind. But, but I learned much more than that because I was put in charge of a clinic that had doctors from all over the world, Chinese medicine doctors, Ayurvedic doctors, uh, uh, chiropractors, naturopaths. And, and the way that we did uh, uh, medicine there, the way, we, the, the way we took care of people was by putting a patient right in the middle and everybody would ask their questions and then we would discuss and come up with a plan. And, and you know, I, I kind of started observing and seeing that the things that people were doing in terms of nutrition, in terms of herbs, in terms of needles, were so effective that I, I was just blown away. My mind was cracked open. Then, then after that experience in which I was exposed to integrative medicine without even knowing the term, I came back to the United States and wor started working in, in hospitals again trying to establish a little network of other practitioners, but it was impossible. Yeah. So, yeah. So at that time I, I stumbled up upon the concepts and practices of cleansing and detoxification. And through that, I got really completely healthy. And that was, that was what did it for me. So I quit the life in, in, in hospitals. I studied functional medicine and, and, uh, and I just, kind of interned with, with all kinds of practitioners to try, try to learn a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And that's the way I, I, I came up with my way of practicing. Yeah, you know, it's an incredible story. And you know, one of the things I noticed as I interview, you know, various people and myself included is that, you know, a lot of times it's either a personal experience or someone in our family that sort of drives us into the natural health space. Because, you know, you look at um, when you're when you come face to face, as you just shared with me with, Okay, it's your own body now, and do you want to put, you know, these synthetic, you know, things that are synthetic, essentially chemicals into your body, and really how can that fix the problem? I'm not saying they don't do anything or in certain emergency situations can't save a life, but hey, long term, is that the path that you yourself want to be on? I know when, when my mom had, was diagnosed with cancer, you know, we, we took a natural approach the second time she was diagnosed, and she, she healed naturally, you know, but I think for a lot of people... Um, out there, you know, that can be surprising. But the truth is your body has an amazing ability to heal itself, especially uh, using things that, you know, God put on this planet, things that are natural. But uh, yeah, I love your yeah. story because it's, it's powerful. And you said it, and it's, and it's actually the subtitle of my first book, um, Restore Your Natural, Your Body's Natural Ability to Heal Itself, right? The mm -hmm. body is always trying to do that. And what functional medicine teaches us is that there's two ways in which the body loses that ability there's either things that are lacking being nutrients or 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 love or, or fun or or sleep or there are things that that are obstructing toxins and stress right so when you when you eliminate whatever is obstructing it and you add whatever is lacking everything starts healing by itself I love it. It's brilliant. And it's simple. That's the other thing. That's one of the things I, I can tell everybody uh, from when I read your book several years ago, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Younger, is that, uh, so this is a book, uh, Clean Gut. So this is a book of yours that I read. And even right from the start, you use a great analogy. And I remember thinking to myself, this is simple. You know, it's not a 500 page manual. It's closer to, you know, just around, you know, 200 pages. And it's, you simplified digestive health and what to add and remove, you know, just very simply remove this, add this. And I thought it was fantastic. So let's dive in that and start there. Let's talk about gut health to start. What have you seen in terms of how the gut affects the rest of your body? So I want to start with that question. And then I want to dive into what are the biggest foods to remove than add? But, but, but what do you see in treating the gut, like in your book, Clean Gut? What, what, what is the basis of that? And how does your gut health affect the rest of your body? So I, I call the gut uh, our Achilles heel. That's where, that's the weakest point of, of human beings in terms of how we 
adapt to to this unnatural life that we're living, right? I, I I always ask people if they have a fish tank, right? And especially if you have a salt water fish tank, you learn very fast that it's very difficult to keep things. You have to keep a certain temperature, a certain pH. You have to, you, you know, you have to really take care of of because any change you suddenly find the, 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 the fish floating or bleeding or, or, or bloated, right? And, and, and our cells that, that are circulating in our blood are like little fish in, in our body, which is a fish tank. And, and the, the way that this fish tank is maintained is through the gut. And, and the thing is that through the gut is where we have the maximum number of exposure to the external world where, where foreign stuff can enter and start damaging the body. You know, there's, there's very few points of contact with the outside world. There's our skin, which is thick and resistant. There's our lungs, but only air comes in. And then there's our gut with, with all these things that we put in our body starts um, going inside. And in, when they're inside the, the tube, they're still outside of the body proper, mm. but they're, but they're um, in the border. And that border is so important. That's why the lining of the intestinal wall has to have these cells that have tight junctions, right? So that no undigested food starts either passing by or getting exposed to what's on the other side which is 80% of our immune system. Mm. So the moment those tight junctions loosen up, creating what's called hyperpermeability or leaky gut, is when the immune system starts detecting all these surfaces and, and mounting an attack. And that attack then is, is transmitted to the rest of the body because when there's a state of emergency, you know, the, the cells start talking with other cells from all over the body. Everybody gets ready for war. And then there's, there's surfaces that we're exposed to through undigested food and bad bacteria and other, and, and other microorganisms that are kind of similar to surfaces of our own cells. And, and, and that's how autoimmune diseases start. And so inflammation, autoimmunity, uh, um, immune responses, they're all mostly generated in the gut. Yeah, it's a great point there. And I love the, you know, the, the analogy uh, you use and just talking about, you know, leaky gut syndrome. And this is something, you know, I wrote about in my book as well, really getting into, there are so many conditions today that are related to gut health. You know, everything from you mentioned autoimmune disease is a big one. Migraine headaches, you know, um, food sensitivities, lack nutrient malabsorption. You know, so many of these are due to what's going on in that gut lining. Even a lot of, you know, some clinical depression, anxiety. Um, you know, yeah, these... I mean, especially because what, what, what we forget or what some of the, or, or people don't know is that there's a huge neurological system within the wall of the intestines or around the wall of the intestines It's actually bigger than the, than the neurological system in our skull. And in there is where a lot of these neurotransmitters and some of them we, we know about, like serotonin and dopamine and, the, and GABA and all these, these neurotransmitters that are the ones that end up determining how you feel or, you know, how depressed you are. Those are mo mostly produced in the gut. Yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic point. You know, I know we've both seen the stat that over 90% of serotonin is produced in the gut. So, I mean, that just shows you how your gut can affect your brain, can affect your mood. So, so these things are obviously a huge deal. So let, let's dive into, you know, there's a lot of people here who's, who are listening and maybe you're a person listening to this broadcast right now and you, maybe you've got leaky gut syndrome, maybe you've got headaches, food sensitivities, you know, you're not absorbing food, right? Any one of those things, you know, leaky gut, here's the other thing I think, uh, Dr. Younger, that surprises people is you can have intestinal permeability, leaky gut, these conditions we're talking about and not have any digestive sy symptoms necessarily. Like it doesn't mean you're gonna have constipation or diarrhea or gas or bloating. Now, a lot of times people will have a degree of those and a lot of people don't realize how important their bowel function is, but you don't have to have those things. I wanted to, wanted to clarify that. But let's jump into diet here, uh, Dr. Younger. So when you have somebody come in, a patient, 
and you need to transform their diet, what are some of the biggest foods they have to remove and what are some of the most important foods that they should be adding back into their diet? So I, I keep it simple too. Um, I, 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 you know, I think of this subject as um, w when I teach my kids uh, around my house how to, how to be safe, right? And, and the most important thing that you do from, from when they're born until they're five or six is to tell them what not to do. Don't put your fingers in the socket. Don't play with, with knives. Don't run with scissors. <laughs> you know, don't jump in the pool when there's nobody around. So, so don't, don't, don't. And, and with food and with nutrition, human beings are at the stage of knowledge of five-year-old, uh, you know, up to five-year-old kids. So the most important thing that I, that I do with my patients is tell them what not to do. And when you tell them what not to do, you don't really even have to know what to do. Because as, as you remove the things that are um, hindering your, 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 your system, then whatever else is there will be much better absorbed, as you said, and will, will benefit you better. So, so, and I always say that if I had a, a, an actor and I put on a lab coat, and, and I throw him in a medical office and start sending him patients. And, you know, he pretends to be a doctor and listens to them and puts a stethoscope on their, on, their, on their chest. And by the end of the visit, the only thing he does is put people on the elimination diet. Judging by the results, he, would be, he or she would be one of the best doctors in the neighborhood, right? Yeah, because, no doubt. Because in my experience as a doctor, 60% of problems that people come to me with are either completely resolved or greatly improved just by being in the elimination diet. And what is the elimination diet? There's a few big ones. Sugar, coffee, alcohol, gluten, and dairy. Mm. And by just eliminating those, the results that I see are unbelievable. Yeah, it's a great point. I love I love how simple you make it, Doc. It's it's it, it's true. So hitting on those things. So you talked about, and and then let me ask you this. So what are your opinions on, you know, there's a lot of different diets out there. You know, I'm going to throw out paleo, for instance. What what is your opinion on grains, refined grains, non-refined grains? How they're cooked? Should they be sprouted? Any thoughts there on grains? Well, um, when when the damage in the gut is significant, when there's hyperpermeability or leaky gut, or when the, and when there's when there's a, um, a, you know a dysbiosis, right? Grains don't help. Yeah. W when the gut is healthy, I, I say fine with grains. Also, sprouted grains are better than not sprouted. But but you know when the gut is healthy, you can allow yourself things that that when your gut is not healthy then are, are, those things are more damaging. The problem is that most people walking around today in the modern world do not have a healthy gut. So, so you know, then you have to say, okay, let's take a time and avoid grains so that you can really heal your gut and then you can reintroduce them and use them accordingly, you know, sporadically or intermittently. Yeah, I, you and I have the exact same perspective on how to use grains, you know, and even if you look at traditional Chinese medicine and Asian medicine where grains are part of the diet, when somebody is ill, they really only have them consume one grain and it's a kanji, it's a rice that's sprouted that's then cooked for, you know, 12 to 24 hours and it's like a mush and that, you know, itself isn't that difficult to digest and it's with a broth. But yeah, for the most part, grains are not doing anybody any favors. And, 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 and the thing is that, that when, you, when you look at other cultures and, and, and how they eat, yeah, they may have grains, but at the same time, they're eating, they're, they're eating fermented foods. And, they're, and they, you know, so, so they, they are, they're maybe damaging things a little bit with grains, but, but on the other hand, they're protecting their gut health with fermented food. So things balance themselves, you know, because I always say a little bit of stress is good. A little bit of damage is good. A little yeah. bit. Yeah. So because you, you, you challenge the body to defend itself and the body is always trying to adapt and survive. That's what the only, the only thing that the body knows how to do. The body doesn't know how to get sick. It doesn't have genetic information of, of, of creating disease. Whatever we call diseases are just 
survival and adaptation mechanisms that's, that, that went on for too long. For example, in, in cardiology, right? One of the most, uh, one of the biggest killers of, of, of Americans is coronary artery disease. But when you look at, at, at the disease, it's not really a disease. What happens is the arteries start getting uh, irritated and, and, and fissures appear, right? And yeah. then what does the body do? It tries to repair with cholesterol. Yeah. So it forms this cholesterol plaque. Now, if the insult is taken away, then the cholesterol plaque is reabsorbed just like when you have a crust after you cut yourself yeah. and it falls and the artery would be fine, just like your skin would be fine under the crust. And then the crust falls and, and serves no purpose. But because most of us have a permanent insult, then the cholesterol keeps on depositing and then, the, and then appear, there, there appears a plaque that blocks the, the flow of, of blood and we call that coronary artery disease. But what I call it really is an, a, um, a survival mechanism that's gone for too long. Yeah, it's a great, great point and great way to put it. You know, it's interesting too today that, you know, you know, testing for cholesterol levels and looking at what people still look at, you know, it still boggles my mind that a lot of doctors are still looking at just overall cholesterol and they're not looking at the ratio of HDL to LDL or, or even some of those other ratios, looking at the type of LDL or the type of HDL. I mean, these things are important. So it's uh, it's a great point. Let, let's go here, doc. So uh, we talked about removing some of the biggest foods. Um, let's talk about supplementation. Now, I think you and I are both on the same plane that supplements are for supplementing an already healthy diet. Actually, before I go to, su well, we can do this with supplements too. What are still some of the biggest things that are missing in the standard American diet today? Some foods, some herbs, or just whether it's a category of foods or something in particular that you learned in Eastern medicine when you're over there in India that you think, man, you know, as Americans, like we need to be getting more of these foods today. And I know we've got people from listening all over in Australia and, and uh, you know, all over the globe, but just in general for, for, for most. Uh, By the way, before I, I answer that question, I wanted to mention two things. First of all, I'm blown away with your products. I love your collagen. And, and, and you are one of the first people that I've seen uh, selling fermented supplements, which I think is a genius idea. So kudos on that. Thanks. Second of all, there's a huge controversy. You, know, there's, you, you listen to all these experts talking about how supplements are not needed and, and, and it's all bogus and you're wasting your money and it all goes down your poo or your pee. And, and, and to those people, I say this. First of all, um, that is true if we were living according to how nature designed us to live, within the atmosphere that nature designed us to live, and eating the things that nature designed us to live. That would be true. Yep. But, it, but, but, but that's not the case. So, so supplements are bridging a gap that we created because of the unnaturalness of our life, right? Yep. So, so, so and, and, the, and the second thing that I, that I would say to those experts is, you cannot argue with results. Over and over, I get people and, and, and I'm trying to help them for certain problems and I use supplements and the difference is abysmal. So, so just to get that out of the way. Yeah. Now, depending, the, your, your, your question is a difficult one. It's a, it's a long one to answer, right? Because it depends, yeah. on, on, it depends on where you live. It depends on how you live. It depends on... on, on a, on, you know, on, on so many things, right? But in general, there's one thing that we are all lacking. Well, there's a few things that we are all lacking generally in, in, in modern cities where, where we eat food that, um, you know, that's transported, even if it's organic, biodynamic farming, vegetables and fruits, they have to be picked up a little earlier because they have to be transported to the city. And, they, and, and you know, so, so you, you get them, you, you pick them before they 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 supercharge themselves with all the real good nutrients. And one of the big missing nutrients is um, uh, magnesium, right? And I know you talk about that all the time. And 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 and, I, but 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 it's still a big problem. And I think that I think that that uh, uh, nutrient deficiency. Uh, is in part responsible for the epidemic of stress and lack of sleep and, and menstrual problems and, and you know, cramping. I'm so many problems that magnesium 
the lack of magnesium is 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 in part responsible for right but then there's many there's there's you know because it's not only that that many of the foods that we grow even if we grow them in a really good way um are lacking certain nutrients even if you eat foods that have all the nutrients then your body cannot really absorb them because your gut is is uh, is broken so so the, the the this subject is so complex right and 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 there's so many ends to tie up that um that we're going to need a, a few podcasts <laughs> to talk about it. yeah yeah you know one of the things i point out too that and and something that i i love about uh ayurvedic medicine is looking at you know i i read this recently or or i looked up this somewhere just at the urban spice consumption in india compared to the us and how many more just herbs and spices just generally they use in their cooking you know it's not even taking a supplement it's just they use a lot of herbs and spices in their cooking I, uh, uh our next door neighbors growing up were uh from india and i remember going in their house and you know they 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 used so many herbs and spices when they were cooking and at first i didn't know if i liked it but after i hung out with them for a while they became close friends started eating and i ended up just loving the food and that's another thing that i love about your work and i remember seeing a, a little video on instagram of of you in your pantry and 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 showing you know, the supplements that you use and 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 the the importance that you give to ashwagandha and turmeric and and holy basil and you know um, recently, I, I have a company called Clean Program, and, and we sell this um, this kit for for a 21 day cleanse, and 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 we also do other things too, right? But um, but recently, um, half of my company was bought by a company called Organic India. And oh yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar with their products. In fact, I, uh, I, I promise I you. I, 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 I had a, I had organic India tea last night. It was a, a Tulsi chamomile tea. Uh, great stuff. I saw your the teas on your in your pantry, and I was I, and, I, and I called my you know my partner, the founder of the company, and I said, "Hey, look, you have to see this." Yeah. And he was he was very happy. He said, "Well, you talk to him, tell him that we want to send him a whole bunch of things for him to try." But it. um, but because of this partnership. I've been going to India. Actually, I'm launching my my cleanse in India in December, and I'm going back in. I just recently came back from there, and and what you say is totally uh, true, but but even more than, than than the way you depicted it, right? Yeah. And and one of the things that I that I'm doing now is is I am I am um, training and getting trained by a group of 150 Ayurvedic nutritionists that work the phone and are in touch with people supporting them on, on health programs. And they're gonna be supporting the clean program on people that do it in India. And, and what we realize is that we do have to adapt the program to India and start using these Ayurvedic herbs and spices. Otherwise, we're not really going to serve them well, right? Yeah. But then I had the idea that I also wanna bring them to the United States to support people here as well. So there's a lot of things happening in, in my life with everything that you were talking about. And, and yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's, it's a great, and you know, I mean, yeah, Tulsi, also known as Holy Basil, is such a great adaptogenic herb that we've talked about too. And uh, re I repeat that, uh, your, your site again, it's uh, the Clean Programs? Clean, cleanprogram.com. Cleanprogram.com. Uh, guys, make sure to check it out there. And Dr. Alejandro's book here, Clean Gut awesome book here as well. So Dr. Uh, Doc, tell, tell me this. What do you typically eat for breakfast, lunch, and I want to know your personal life. What do you typically eat for, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for yourself? What do you like? So, so I barely ever have breakfast. Yeah. You know, I, I, I mean, I, I know there's a huge, uh, um, um, fashionable thing to do which is intermittent fasting you know and when you do intermittent fasting um one of the easiest meals to have to skip is is breakfast right but um but i don't know since ever since i was 14 15 years old i i never had breakfast i only i only started having breakfast um for a few years when i was doing a physical training and i wanted to have a six pack so i was eating six times a day and oh yeah and, and doing a a keto, ketogenic diet and one day we'll talk about ketogenesis which which is something that really interests me and i'm reading your book right now so i'm 
I'm a, I'm very curious about your take on the whole thing. But um, yeah. but other than that, I, I I barely have breakfast, right? And if I do have breakfast, um, most of the times I I, I have a, a smoothie of some of some sort, and and in the smoothie I put some fruit, uh, either water, coconut water, maybe sometimes almond milk. I'm not that big of a fan of almond milk for myself, but um um you know other people it's not that it's not healthy but i just don't like the taste but um but um and i start adding things right for example uh, one of the greatest things that i learned in india was how to use moringa mm, and yeah. and 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 moringa is a natural multivitamin multimineral you know i i spend time with a master of ayurvedic medicine who was also an md called Narendra Singh. He, he died now, but he was, he was a legend in India. And, and, and his book is just the encyclopedia of, of herbs and, and, and Ayurveda. But, but he told me that he, many, many, many years ago, he was the, the doctor for the Indian army. And, he, and, and once they were stranded somewhere where the Germans were passing by for a, a few months, and the only thing they had around was Moringa trees, and they had a few cows. And they survived for two or three months. I don't remember exactly. Only on Moringa and some milk. Wow. That's yeah. incredible. I, I actually have a, uh, well, I have a lot of supplements. If somebody walked in my house, I mean, my supplement cabinet is massive. But uh, I didn't have Moringa this morning. I had it a few days ago as well. But I have a powder. I put it in with some other greens and some other berries like goji and acai and maki berry powder. But uh, yeah, Moringa is send, amazing. I'm, I'm going to send you some of the organic India Moringa because it's like really, really good. And, and yeah, in, anyway, I added a little Moringa. I added a little ashwagandha. I added a little uh, turmeric. And, um, and then I add sometimes bee pollen a little bit of sea salt, you know, I, I, I do like my little experiments, right? And, and, and fill it up with nutrients. And, and that carries me for a long time. I don't really believe that human beings are best served for health reasons by having breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I think that that is a social um, construct that we created in order to live an organized life and work from nine to five or whatever it is that we do. And then there's all the social aspect of it. Right. But if you think about it for thousands of years, we used to run around roaming the planet looking for food. And yeah. when we, when we found it, we feasted. And when we didn't found it, we fasted and, and kept looking for food. So our genes are still functioning optimally in that way. But now we find ourselves eating three, four, five times a day. And that is a big part of the problem. So, so yes, I do have kids and I have to teach them an organized life. And I do breakfast, lunch, and dinner for them. But I myself, I just eat whenever, whenever, you know, whenever, <laughs> whenever I'm hungry or whenever I'm anxious. Yeah, you know, I've gone through a lot of cycles of, and it just depends on, for, for me, just a lot of it is activity. If I'm working out a lot, a lot of most of the time I will do breakfast if I'm going through periods where I'm not up most of the time I'll skip it but it's um you know it, it is interesting to think about that you know our body gives us signals hey you're hungry then eat you know and a lot of times I, I mean I wouldn't get hungry till you know one o'clock sometimes or noon you know if I were just listening to exactly what my body you know was telling me um but you know the, the other thing this brings up a principle you reminded me of earlier and this is a principle that I'll tell you this is the greatest health principle that I've ever been taught, I believe. And it's that food doesn't heal you, your body heals itself. Now, food can transform your environment, right? You know, food can give your body the building blocks, but you know, if you cut your finger, like food doesn't heal that, right? Your body heals itself. Now it's gonna use food as the building blocks, but that's something I love about what you said. That's the thing that's so great about fasting, right? Like if we're not eating, our body is better able to use that energy that your body would use to digest and cleanse something or repair something or, you know, produce more stem cells for regeneration. It's, you know, so, so fasting is something that you and I know, I mean, whether it was done for religious purposes in the Bible or used in Ayurvedic medicine, you know, it's, it's been, it's been used for a lot for, for a lot of things, everything from health to spiritual breakthroughs. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I just, as you say, is it's about creating the conditions removing the obstacles 
and adding what's needed, right? And yeah. and many times, and many times, nothing is needed because the body will 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 recycle things, and it will grab things from here and put them there, and then you know, and 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 reorganize. And that's one of the things that happens during during fasting. After a certain period of time, there the 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 body starts looking for you know, well, so where do I get certain uh, raw materials? And it starts breaking down diseased cells in order to use the building blocks for, uh, for other things, right? And it's called phagocytes, right? Or, or autophagia. And it starts eating itself. And the first things that it eats is the disease cells. And that's, that's how sometimes through fasting, you can get rid of cancers and other problems. Yeah, I love it. It's a great point. And, you know, I think, I think fasting would be more popular. I mean, obviously the scientific evidence and just historic evidence is there, but uh, it's hard, right? It's hard well, for some people. But I think when somebody has fasted once, I, th I think that's the hardest time. The first time you fast, I feel like it's hard. But once you do it once or a few times, I think it gets to be a lot easier. But go ahead. Yeah. Well, the thing is, the thing is, if you think about it, a lot of people fast because, you know, the Jews fast for Yom Kippur, the, the Christians fast for Lent, the, 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 the Muslims fast for Ramadan, the, yep. the, you know, the Buddhists are fasting all the time for, for whatever reason. So, so it, it's not that foreign a concept for, for a lot of people around the world. Here in the, in the, in the modern cities in America, it's more of a, of a foreign thing and people have a resistance to it, right? But but yeah, as you said, once you've done it, then then you realize, you know, after the first couple of days, um, then then you you're flying. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for people too, you can do several days of a fast or hey, just skipping breath, you know, waiting until your body says, I'm hungry. I mean, there's a lot of value in that, of course, as well. Um, want to remind everybody, check out Dr. Alejandro's book here, Clean Gut. Now, listen, he's got other great books as well. I read his uh, part of his book, Clean, uh, one of his first books there as well. And also, he's got programs, you know. Uh, check out his 21-day detoxification program. You can go to Clean Program. That's Clean, wait, right? Program? Yeah, cleanprogram.com. And that's, that's a 21-day program, which is the basis of, of my first book, Clean. I'm actually writing another book, which is an update of everything that the world has, has found out about cleansing and detoxification. And I found some tricks to make a seven day program really, really effective. So that's coming up in, in I mean, I, my deadline is March. So next year sometime, the, my new book is gonna come out. I love it. Well, I can't wait to, uh, wait to read it. And so just a breakdown of some of the stuff we talked about, you know, I know you talked about uh, removing, can you remind us of those five things to remove or some of the big things to remove? Dairy, gluten, sugar, alcohol, and coffee. And, 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 and in general, anything that comes in a jar, in a tube, in a can, in a bag that, that, that looks weird, you know, anything that, that your great grandma would not recognize as food. Yeah, great advice. We talked a little bit about magnesium. We talked about more herbs. You specifically mentioned turmeric, ashwagandha, and uh, holy basil, some great ones there to get as well. And l listen to your body. Consider doing a little bit of intermittent fasting can be good there as well. And uh, Dr. Younger, I'm, again, I'm a huge fan of yours. I'm just so honored for you to be on the broadcast. You've done so much with helping uh, how to heal their bodies, especially in terms of gut health and their immune system and detoxification. I want to say, hey, thanks so much for being on uh, today's program. Anytime. I'm a huge fan of your work. I follow you closely on Instagram. and I, I, Sometimes I get a big laugh because you, you, you're funny too. Awesome. All right, everybody. Hey, thanks for listening again to another uh, episode. And I'll be back next week with another show. Thanks, everybody. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed in this podcast are not medical advice and have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. In some cases, individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein.